Welcome to Unboxed. I'm your host, Connie Nam, the founder of Astrid and Mew. In these conversations, I speak to the founders of some of the most innovative, bold, and exciting businesses to discover the person behind the brand and what it took for them to build their empires. My guest today is co-founder of Lockdown Liquor, Natasha Thomas. This conversation encapsulates how she turned Lockdown Liquor from a passion project into a fully-fledged business, how she balances her work and life when her husband is her co-founder, and Natasha's advice for growth and getting investment. We have never in, the, in our wildest <laughs> dreams ever thought of having a liquor business. We want to help fund more awareness about early stage pandemics. Early doors, I think we were growing like, you know, two, 200%. It, it was really, really fast, rapid growth. Hi, Tash. Hi. Uh, welcome to my studio and welcome thank to my you. podcast. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm delighted to be here. Yeah, I'm really excited to delve yeah, more too. in depth into your personal life and your professional life. Oh, I'm delighted to. Thank you so much again for having me. So tell me about yourself as Natasha Thomas, also your businesses as well. Sure, sure. So I was born and raised in Ireland. Um, my parents moved there probably early 70s and then both myself and my brother were born there. I come from a pretty entrepreneurial background. My dad was a writer, hence moving to Ireland. Um, it was a big community of writers and poets back then, still is actually. Um, and yeah, I think we just kind of came from a background of, you know, I guess a strong work ethic, really wanted to kind of do something different. Always, you know, I was always as a child thinking of different things to do. And, you know, I, I think I always had that kind of burning desire to have something for myself, a business. Instead of playing dolls, I was off trying to, you know, read. I think I read Animal Farm age six with no understanding of what it was about. But, you know, it seemed like a sensible book to read. You know, the background that I've had has always been led to that, to kind of be more entrepreneurial. My, my brother also works in film. So both of yeah. us took that. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess like being a writer is entrepreneur, but equally it's, um, I guess, in the more creative space. Self-discipline. Yeah, yeah. So it's yeah. kind of same kind of thing. You know, you're you're on your own. You're you're working for yourself. You're, you know, as you said, it's creative. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think I learned a lot from him. My mum has been a massive, you know, driving force behind what I've done. She's always been so supportive. She always supported my dad so much. And I think that was, you know, we came from a really good supportive family, which, you know, usually helped me within my career. So you started Total Management Group when you were quite young, right? Yes. I, I mean, pretty young. I, I came to, I left Ireland um, probably early 2000s and I worked for a couple of companies over here, got some experience. Um, I worked for a really big um, agency actually at, at one point and I kind of just thought, you know, I, I liked what they were doing, but I kind of saw there's a real opportunity within the hospitality space. And I really wanted to go into, I guess, providing opportunity for corporate entertainment and hospitality that wasn't already existing. So everyone at the time was kind of doing the usual, going to Wimbledon or, you know, doing Ascot and bringing clients there. And I was thinking, you know, why don't we think outside the box and maybe, you know, you can bring clients to London Fashion Week or go to the Brit Awards or do something totally unique. So off the back of that, um, I was working with some key clients at the time and I decided to go out on my own. And a couple of my clients came with me and said, well, you know, we'll come with you. And if you set up your own business and off it went, really, and that's how we started. But fundamentally, it was 2006, really. So, you know, quite how, a few years ago. How old were you in 2006? Gosh, 23, 24? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How did yeah. you have that courage to do that? Well, you know, it was kind of like everything. I think, you know, I, I, there was nothing to lose. I thought, you know, I wasn't enjoying what I was doing. I, I, I learned early doors that... I wasn't great at working for other people. So I kind of wanted to always, I always knew the direction I wanted to go in was to work for myself. It was a leap of faith, of course, but I, it was kind of a leap of faith I was prepared to take rather than work for someone else. So what were the early years like? Hard, very hard. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Tell me more. Yeah, I mean, you know what it's like, you've set up your business clearly uh, very well, but at the start, you know, it's, I, I was very hand to mouth. Yeah. Did you have savings? Did you? No. Did your family support you? Like, how did you survive those early years? Luckily, we had, as I said, those first couple of clients. You know, it was just me, and you know that typical story of you know on my kitchen table all alone. But it, you know, it got, that's kind of what it was like. Just the first year or two, it was very much you know keeping your costs down. So my, you know, I had no real outgoings, and it was a very kind of hand to mouth business. Um, it was really only as the years evolved, probably. 18 months after I set up, 
I took on my first employee, actually, who's still with me. Um, she's now my managing director. Fast forward now, you know, we have, you know, 60, 70 people working within the businesses. And, you know, it's a very isolating time. I feel, yeah. I, you know, you do feel you have your team, et cetera. But, you know, if you don't have that really strong, reliant leadership team, it can be really isolating. And I think that's something that people don't really talk about a lot. I think, you know, everyone talks about the good times and the running a business and the success and, you know, how great the numbers look, but no one really talks about, you know, how challenging, you know, yeah, the times yeah, in between absolutely. are. But I think team is hard and I think you can't always please everyone. And again, I think everyone expects you to have the perfect solution for everything. And as a, as a business scales and evolves, you know, we are going to make mistakes. There are going to be things that we don't get perfect. And there are going to be, you know, uh, that's just part of the scalability of yeah. a business, you know. Yeah. Um, COVID was hard. I think that was probably the most challenging. You know, we had to make some pretty big decisions. You know, obviously, you know, in my industry, you know, being an event travel and creative agency, travel went to total stop, you know, no one was doing live events. So, you know, we went from a pretty big business, you know, 20, 30 million business to, well, making a couple hundred grand. So, you know, it, that was a huge drop down. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine as mm. an events business. But out of yeah. all this, like, you know, you've um, set up Lockdown Liquor yes, during that yeah, time, which yeah. everyone knows about. Can yeah. you tell me more about yeah. the inspiration behind it and how sure. well, how it's doing right now? Yeah, sure. So to your point, we were in midst of lockdown, March, you know, back end of March 2020. And um, yeah, myself and my husband, Jack, have always had a real passion for food and drink. Um, you know, we've always traveled around. We've always loved, you know, trying different restaurants, trying different drinks, a particular love for tequila. During the course of the lockdown, we loved, to, like everyone else, loved to be at home cooking and making cocktails. And we got talking one evening saying, you know, it's such a flaff, you know, I'm sure you know, to, to make a simple drink, simple margarita, for example, you know, you have to do so much. It's like do the limes, you know, do the mix, do everything. And it takes, you know, about 10 minutes to make, you know, a drink. And it's it, it is just a kind of laborious, uh, time consuming process. So we, we kind of said, you know, wouldn't it be just great to be able to, you know, bottle a premium premium level cocktail so you can literally pour as you go. So you can buy a said bottle, come home, pour over ice and you get the same quality drink as you would you know from a mixologist or in a top bar we looked on the market and there wasn't anything out there there was a few obviously the rtd the registering category definitely existed but it certainly wasn't um at that point in time too much premium uh quality out there um so we at the point of time we actually just did it for charity we set up uh friends and family we sold bottles got up to about four or five hundred bottles out of our kitchen you know every couple of days and we gave all the money to nhs yeah it, i remember it, this yeah it was you know we did it for a three four week period and it was brilliant everyone loved it and it, it, it got a real nice ma amount of momentum uh just just through network of friends saying to other friends oh you should try this they're selling it online and you know they'll they'll box well, it was it more of a spontaneous idea you totally decided to do just during lockdown so like, hence we, lockdown liquor. We have yeah. never in, the, in our wildest <laughs> dreams ever thought of having a liquor business. It was never, we never thought about it. And, you know, my husband actually came up with the name Lockdown Liquor. And, you know, he's really, really creative. So he's 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 my partner within Lockdown Liquor. My husband, as I said, also. Um, and he is the kind of creative genius behind it. He's He does all our branding. He does all the bottle design. You know, he does everything from start to finish. And I'm a bit more in the background, I guess, driving, you know, the strategy, the numbers, the kind of market placements, the collaborations, commercial opportunity. And he does fully the kind of creative. So it kind of works really well. But in a nutshell, it went from being a fun passion project to a full blown uh, business. We got a very early um I guess, approach for investment, probably about four or five months in from a very well, I guess, well seasoned investor who can spot where the markets are moving. He's a highly experienced financial guy, a uh, fantastic man. And he um, approached us and said, look, I really think this is going to be a really big growing market. What you guys are doing is amazing. I'd love to get behind it. You know, can I come in as a, an investor? So the business grew really fast. Um, 
early or early doors, I think we were growing like, you know, two, 200%. It, it was really, really fast, rapid growth. Um, his investment allowed us to make the decision quite early to bring everything in-house. So we... And that's very unusual in this category, right? Very unusual. Yeah. Everyone thought we'd lost our mind because they were like, that's a huge investment. You know, it's hundreds and hundreds of thousands that we are going to take over, you know, seven, eight thousand square foot. We're going to, you know, customize machinery to bottle three thousand bottles per hour where we can own and create our entire bottling system. And therefore, we believe that when the market opens out, the bigger strategy was that it would flip from a direct consumer product to a direct business product. So everyone was like, but we're still in lockdown. You know, I we just don't see it. And I was like, it, it will come it's because people will shift and then the hospitality market will open up. And this opportunity to, to provide, a, I guess, a solution for a marketplace that now is understaffed um, and under-equipped to, I guess, make and provide a fast solution for a growing market being the cocktail industry it will be a perfect fit. So we invested heavily into the production. Um, we got that all set up and we sat back and we waited for lockdown to kind of come and roll, I guess, come to an end. During lockdown, I guess, sorry, just to go back a stage, we probably did about 40 or 50 different partnerships or opportunities within some really amazing brands which gave us this huge amount of visibility across you know technology across entertainment fashion so we were working with everyone from you know Netflix they were coming to us asking us to do bespoke blend for them to gift all the BAFTA winners you know we were working with you know Spotify we were working with you know Ralph Lauren we were working with everyone and oh, that's great which was, were, were you tapping into your existing client network or so, like was it so did they come to you? they're a bit of both so we definitely had a network through total management um who were coming to us we were doing at that stage during lockdown we were still doing quite a lot of uh virtual um events so it really fitted well because they needed an f&b solution uh for everyone at home so they were having these kind of large conferences and people were needing to have, you know, food be delivered and, you know, they could enjoy a nice cocktail together. So we also provided a good solution, you know, by offering lockdown liquor cocktails. But I think um, that really gave us a really large, I guess, marketing platform mm. that normally you wouldn't have got had lockdown not have happened because you would have had to pay a lot of money for yeah. that. And it's such a unique proposition. It is. A unique, it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. The products are right. And with Jack, um, your husband and wives and your co-founders, yes. which one came first? How did you meet him? So me and Jack have been together about 16 years. We we're married 16 years and probably together like four or five pre that. So we were together a long time. We know each other so well. So he used to play rugby. Um, he got sadly injured quite early on in his career and then pivoted um, came in, worked with me in total management. He was really instrumental in helping me set up the travel division, which we ha which we still have, and is you know a really big division now. So he was very much um, part of that whole growth um, period with me. We worked together for, gosh, seven eight years pre COVID, and then lockdown liquor. So now he's fully on lockdown liquor. Um, certainly the last couple of months he's transitioned fully over. Um, he's still a director within TMG. He still give creative context. So he'll still come on board. We're going through a big rebrand at the moment. He'll he'll be a huge part of that, but his day-to-day -day job would be with Lockdown Liquor. And then with me, I'm probably 80% with TM and 20% Lockdown. And where I kind of play my part with Lockdown Liquor really is the, the larger strategic, you know, understanding how our growth will look and, you know, m making those bigger decisions. Um, but he's definitely more day to day. Mm. But so, you know, we work really, really well together and we have a really hard and fast rule. I mean, we do break it on occasionally, but we try really, really hard that when we do come home in the evening, that we have dinner together and we try and just, you know, separate the kind of work life. I was about um, to ask you. Yeah. How do you otherwise, do that? Yeah. I mean, I just really like him. So luckily, you know, <laughs> but, you know, what I do like about him is, you know, he's really, he's really ambitious. You know, we have a lot of, we have a lot of common ground and he understands me better than I think anyone would. So he, he understands you know, the kind of ups and downs. He understands the challenges of having a business. 
and he's kind of been through it all. So I, with me and likewise me with him. So I think, you know, that's been really important. And I think if we didn't have such a deep rooted, good friendship at the base of, you know, yes, we're husband and wife, but at the base of our working relationship, it would be really, really challenging. But, you know, we just get each other. So we don't really kind of gripe on top of each other. We don't mm. really have, we don't really fall out about much. We just kind yeah. of have, we might have a heated discussion about something, yeah. but we won't, you know, we'll, we'll generally come to the same solution yeah. at the same time. Does your husband, like, do you go to him for a lot for advice or how does it work? Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Do. I always do. Like, yeah. he gives me sometimes unsolicited advice, yeah. but they're like normally valid. Sometimes yes. I like scream at him, but yeah. like, if I think about it, they're all yeah. valid. He's yeah. very sensible. Yeah. And we've got very different strengths, so I'm more creative. Yeah. Like, I kind of live in my head. I have so many ideas that I want to just throw out and he's very logical yeah. and very highly analytical and super practical. Yeah. So like yeah. whenever I throw ideas, he, he would be like, oh, how are you going to make that work? And yeah. I'm like, I'm not thinking about how to make it work i'm just talking about ideas yeah so yeah i think we've got this balance but that's that's what that's exactly what you need so yeah, that's yeah, a yeah. really really good yeah, balance so, right yeah, so he's like super sensible yeah and he's a he's an investor he invests in public um, public markets so he sees loads of businesses so yeah he's able to bring in like macro trends and yeah. tell me about them so that's super useful as yeah. well this episode is sponsored by harbottle and lewis as a first-time entrepreneur, getting advice from somebody I can trust who understands legals as well as commercials and the startup ecosystem was so crucial in the early days. This is what I found in Tony Littner, my friend and partner at Harbottle and Lewis. He was so knowledgeable and seasoned, yet he never made me feel stupid with legal jargons. Quite the opposite. He was able to explain things in simple language and could relate to commercial points like a founder. Since my first fundraise Tony supported me with, Harbottle and Lewis have been a genuine strategic partner throughout my journey. From subsequent fundraises to IP, operations, and HR matters. For over 60 years, Harbottle and Lewis have acted for some of the most creative, talented, and entrepreneurial people in corporate across all of their legal needs, both business and personal. Their client list is brimming with household names the most exciting brands and coolest startups like Astrid and Mew. To find out more, you can follow them on Instagram and LinkedIn. Just search for Harbottle and Lewis. To find out how Tony and the team at Harbottle can support you, you can contact him directly for an initial conversation via the firm's website at harbottle.com slash Tony hyphen Littner. This episode is sponsored by BAO. Many people will know Astrid and Mew for our buzzing stores and their services. What they don't know is that we are a digital first brand. After our quick store expansion, we were looking for an agency who can elevate the brand, guide us to scale and build a truly omni-channel brand. That's when we came across by association only, otherwise known as BAO, the Shopify plus agency for the world's most design conscious luxury brands. They are founder and values led just like Astrid and Mew, they also just got the, the intangibles of brand building while being highly technical. The founders, James, Joe, and Evan, are so down to earth and are there to talk to you whenever you need them. BAO is a true partner and an extension of my team. If you're looking for an award-winning Shopify Plus agency that prioritizes design, technical innovation, and commercial growth, please visit byassociationonly.com, also linked in our show notes. Did you guys do investment? Have you, I can't remember, have you guys bought in a bit of investment into your... Yeah, yeah, yes. we did. So I had um, three years into the business, I yeah. had a group of angel investors yes. come in. And then in 2019, so that's like three years after the angel investment, I had an institutional investor called Atronym. Okay. And then they bought out most of the... Um, angel investors. And how's that journey been? Yeah, it's been really good. I was very deliberate. I actually didn't need the money when I brought Atronim in. So yeah. it was a more casual conversation between me and the CEO, Marcus, of the fund. And he was just such a nice guy. Yeah. And he was an operator before. He wasn't groomed as an investor. He used to run Swarovski America. So he kind of knew the challenges of running a team and being a CEO. So that's what I really liked about him. So yeah. it wasn't, and it's also a family office. So it's not about hyper growth. It's more about like, you know, maintaining like sustainable growth and supporting the founder and going that's on really this journey yeah. for the long run. So yeah. they think very long terms, that's good. Which, which was a very good fit for me. 
yes, completely different to PE. So yeah. yes, yeah, yes. yeah. So yes. no, that's, yeah. I can see why that would be a preferable route for sure. Yeah. No, that's interesting. Yeah. Cause you know, funding, I think, you know, we've touched on it before. It, it is, it is a minefield, you yeah, know, yeah, um, absolutely. you know, it's, it's, it's challenging, you know, yeah. I mean, with lockdown liquor again, you know, we had this one key angel who came in early and then we've been very lucky actually that you know, we've got a handful of key angel investors who have been, you know, super supportive. They all sit in the space of, you know, either finance or certainly understand what we're trying to achieve here. And I think that really helps as well. And then with TM, you know, we were going through just before COVID, we were going through quite a big process um, with private equity. Um, as you can imagine, COVID did us no favor. So it all kind of crumbled down instantaneously, which was hard in some ways because we'd done a year off the rounds, as you can imagine, all the fireside chats and, you know, everyone's telling you everything you want to hear. But actually, when you delve a little bit deeper, private equity is a little bit different. Now, by the way, no, it's I, a different direction. It's a different direction. Something that is definitely probably right for total management, but you know I wouldn't go there with lockdown liquor. Yeah. It's a it's a different landscape, and it wouldn't be for us. Uh, but for total management group, you know, um, it is a good fit, and I I can see yeah, the value yeah, yeah. value in that. Yeah, and early stage entrepreneurs like uh, certainly for me, I didn't have a lot of choice in like who I pick as an investor. Yeah. But I feel like in hindsight, I I should have been more cho choosy. Yeah. What, what do you think? What do you think? founders need to look for in investors the angel investors i always say and they think i'm you know I, I always overstate that you know look this is a really 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 good opportunity clearly because that's what i'm telling you and i'm i'm, I'm, I'm explaining you know the, the, the overriding strategy but there will be bumps along the way so you know you're never going to have this perfect three-year plan model laid out where it's going to go you know quarter by quarter and you're just going to smash those numbers out there's going to be like say seasonality there's going to be things that will happen that you know we weren't prepared for because that's such a nature of a startup business so you know with angel investors I was very choosy about who we brought on. And, you know, we got a lot of, I, I guess there was a lot of early interest within the business and a lot of interest that we did turn down. But, you know, we do our analyzed budget, you know, year on year. And, you know, we, and we try and we, we trade and we map to plan mm -hmm. against it. That does work well. But, you know, there's definitely, we're in a category now with Lockdown Liquor where it's, it's, it's pretty much a, there's no historic data. So you can't say, well, four years ago, we were tracking here um, within this category. It's a, it's, a, it's a really new category within the drink space. It's accelerated so far. It's overtaken the likes of gin and tequila. It's got so far ahead of itself. But we don't have any, you know, proven record to really understand, for example, the seasonality. Um, we've obviously gone through just coming out of the back of um, COVID. There was definitely seasonality within the hospital space, uh, within Brexit happening and all of that fun and games. The flag for me would be to have some that was chew in the weeds of the business mm. because at the end of the day, that's not what I need them to do. Yeah. I need them to, you know, believe in what myself and Jack and my team are doing to get behind the strategy, to be supportive. Obviously, I, there needs to be a very clear communication between what we're doing to them because I think there's nothing worse also than when you don't communicate with your investors. You need mm. to always be very yeah. open, transparent, that they have a real clear visibility of what is happening, what your, you know, what your strategy is. But likewise, you know, they're not going to be in your office every week telling yeah. you, you know, so yeah. it's, it's, it's that kind of understanding. And then, you know, and I think that's a good, good angel. And I, yeah. I, I like to get angel yeah. investors who are a little bit more seasoned, who have done it before because they kind of know what to expect. And I think that's a lot easier rather than just having someone yeah, yeah. They've who's gone, new in. Like they've seen it before. They've, they've seen, seen, it before. seen the ups and downs. They've seen the ups they, and downs. You yeah, know, they have w wisdom. Yes. And they kind of go, okay, look, we, we understand this. And, you know, and there's going to be ups and downs and we just need to go with the flow a little bit with this. Yeah, um, I completely agree. Yeah. I feel like um, having that wisdom that businesses do go through ups and yeah. downs. And I think someone who you can be open to. Yeah. If you're like having a hard time, like they'll be open like to listening to you and not judge you for it. A hundred percent. That's so important. So important. I think um, that clear line and, and yeah, I think that's 
that's really important. Actually, yeah. that's a really, and, really good point yeah. to say, to be able to sit down and have a cup of coffee and go, you know, and that you don't feel like you have to give them the fluff because I don't want to, I'm not, I'm not here to fluff anyone. I want to tell them this is what it is and it's hard yeah. or this is amazing. We just want this and be proud of the goods, that, you know, but you yeah, can't yeah. have the good with the bad, without the bad, you know, there's going to be ups and yeah, downs. Yeah, exactly. Because if I'm an investor, I would want my founder to tell me everything. I, everything. So I know I exactly tell, what's yeah. going on. Exactly. Yeah. And at the same time, they need to give you autonomy. I think autonomy is so important. Absolutely. Yeah. And then with the private equity, you know you you just need to know what you're buying into or should I say what they're buying into I guess the power dynamics shift a little bit because they're like I guess a huge institution like yes. professionalized there's so many upsides to that you know they really do professionalize your business you really do you report really clearly and you feel that you are very much held accountable to everything you're doing, which actually can work really, really yeah, well. It really so, depends on what you want out of the business. What you life, want, right? If you, you know, want an exit and be well, super rich, like that's the right. Exactly. And that's what I was going to say. You know, I'd only ever suggest to anyone to take, you know, PE on if you have an exit in mind. So for, for me with TM, we have an exit in mind, you know, that's very clear strategy. Um, and I think PE then really suits or strategic uh, buyer really suits a business like that. Uh, with lockdown liquor, I think, you know, for me, it's a bit more at this moment in time, certainly, you know, angel investors work really, really well. And, you know, how we're doing it is seems to be working well. So that's kind of, yeah. but so it, it just shows you how two businesses can require yeah, yeah, totally yeah. different funding. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. it's interesting. Yeah. yeah. And with lockdown, it's not a lockdown project anymore. It's a no. long term endeavor. Yeah. Like what, what are your thoughts around the branding? Right. Because it was, yeah. I guess, um, you know, you, yeah. you came up with lockdown liquor because it was crafted during lockdown yeah no it's a really good question and and actually quite a lot of people ask they say oh you will you keep the name and, and and we've we've thought long and hard about it and we will the answer is we are going to keep the name and we want people i know obviously lockdown wasn't you know the greatest memory for a lot of people but there is some memory to be had from lockdown and it's a bit like back in the day the kind of speakeasy bars that existed yeah. etc i i feel like you know it is who we are it's part of our dna um, we've actually pledged um, 10% of the business to Founders Pledge. I'm not sure if you know about Founders Pledge, but Founders Pledge is, um, you know, where you can pledge equity to, from your business and you can then put that finance towards, you know, funding, you know, it can be anything for us. We want to help fund more awareness about early stage pandemics because I kind of feel that, you know, we were the few people who got something quite good out of lockdown. So we, we, we took away a business from it. We came out the other side and we had a really great business and it just felt right to give something back. And, you know, and I think that was really, really important to us as, you know, founders and as a business to keep our core values and to make sure that people don't, will never forget now that, you know, it is part of a bigger picture, a bigger, you know, funding cause to research for pandemics. Yeah. So I think keeping lockdown and having that tie in with Founders Pledge does make sense. Um, so, yeah, so we have that. And we have also diffusion brand Easy Liquor, which is our canned product, you know, which we did name slightly different. Not because we wanted to kind of come away from lockdown because it's still, I guess, powered by lockdown liquor. But it was just a bit more of a fun, playful, you know, I guess, you know, breakaway brand from the lockdown premiumized brand. Yeah. So coming out of lockdown, lockdown liquor has now gone into, I guess, like uh, other distribution channels, right? Yes. You're going, how, how do you say that? On trade? On trade, uh, in off liquor trade. Terms? Yeah. Oh, on trade, off trade. Yes. Like you have easy liquor. Tell me more about yes. that. Yes. So how it works really is that you've got, you know, you can have hotels, hotel bars, restaurants, and it's very much, you know, they'll bottle and serve so it'll be behind a bar so we're with a few national restaurant groups where we may have a menu within 90 restaurants uh, across their portfolio and they'll have nine of our cocktails and so if you went in and sat down and said oh I'll have a I don't know elderflower fritz or whatever that would be uh, it'll be one of our blends and they and would have just renamed it. Is that branded as um, lockdown liquor? Some places are. It says it's powered by lockdown liquor, others not. So, you know, we don't mind. Some restaurant groups, they prefer not. They prefer just have everything white labeled. 
Um, but 90% of the time, they like to have it powered by or yeah. locked on liquor on the label. Because yeah, it's a brand people recognize, right? Exactly, exactly. And certainly now, over the last 18 months, it's got lo- a lot more, I guess, visibility. So people do recognize it. So when they see a drink and they're like, oh, I'll have one of your margaritas or pecanis because they know how we make it and how yeah. it tastes. So it's yeah. really quite nice yeah. and recognizable. I in that suppose sense. that's a very unusual way of... I guess, selling cocktail because most of the restaurants or bars would have their own bartender and they'd have their own signature cocktails. Um, Yes. Were you the first ones doing this? So we were, in short, yes, in scale. So there was definitely some, I guess, pre-prepping cocktails before COVID and during COVID. So you could go into a restaurant and they'll have pre-batched, that's what it's called, the margaritas. So, you know, you could go into a very well members club and you could say could I have a drink and it would be pre-batched because then if you could say oh could I have mine a little bit more spicy they'd say we can't do that because it's pre-batched. I didn't know that. Yes so it's interesting there's a little trade secret there for you so but that was costing them a lot of time and effort because they need their staff to basically whip it up so pre-batched so they spend maybe six hours pre-service getting it all ready so it just wasn't very economical um what we were offering was a solution that you know we could how we are offering uh, for the trade comes in liter bottles so it's not the same as the direct consumer that you see on our uh, e-commerce platform um and the liter bottles are either on their speed rail or behind the bar and they just shake and pour basically what we found when when everything came out when I guess COVID ended and things started opening up a lot of people uh, couldn't get staff so you know obviously with Brexit happening there was a big you know so no one could employ mixologists or even extra bar staff and you know having someone there making cocktails all evening was a little bit of a luxury and you know high on their OPEX so you know we were kind of going to them saying look you know if you can provide if we can provide you with say eight cocktails on your cocktail list um that are you know pre ready to drink um therefore it will you can serve them in 30 seconds your barman will take at least two minutes per drink so just and you're they're, they're still making if not more margins so you know economically it's it makes far more sense so what was interesting we probably had when we went to market, about 30% of all the restaurants were like, okay, this is a no-brainer, we're in. Then you had the 30% who were like, oh, no, 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 we can't be seen to do that. You know, our customer doesn't want, to, you know, everything has to be made fresh. Fast forward four months, they're like, come back to us with your solution because we can't we can't serve cocktails anymore. We can't get the supply chain, so we can't get all their produce for the cocktails. We can't get people to serve their cocktails never mind make them so it's a total nightmare you know so we were just saying to them look this is a perfect solution it offers consistency so therefore you know if someone comes in really likes a margarita or whatever the drink they're drinking and they reorder it it'll taste exactly the same because there's nothing worse i'm not sure if you've ever been to a bar and you order a drink and the first one's brilliant the second one you're like oh it doesn't taste the same yeah, it always happens it, it always it really happens. depends on the bartender it, totally depends on the bartender so it's really really important to offer the customer uh consistency because then you return on sale because they'll end up buying more than one drink because yeah, they'll like so it interesting. because otherwise they'll change to another drink and then they'll just go i'm just going to go back onto a vodka soda because they know it they understand it so it's yeah. kind of just you know it's just the way it is and then we had the last you know 30 40 percent who from outright they were like no way we're five star we're never doing this and, you know, now they're all doing it. How so, do you convince them? Well, I mean, it makes so much sense when you explain this to me, but like, yeah, it, you know, it, it, it's it takes not a while. very intuitive, right? It takes a while. A lot of the bigger, you know, the five-star properties that we're now in, it wasn't like an overnight, you know, tasting session. And they, you know, said, great, let's, let's put it in. You know, they do go through quite a few rounds of tasting. They'd come down to our plant. They might send their head barman down to curate a cocktail that is, you know, with the produce that they like using. So, again, going back to the really important part of having our own production is that we're able to customize blends. So if you've got a leading hotel who their biggest selling drink is martini, but they use a certain amount of different produce within the martini, they can come to us, give us the produce, we'll basically pre-batch it for them and they'll have the perfect end product so it's like their barman is making it every time so it wasn't as quick as we thought with some of the conversion to sale but 
now it's really picking momentum. So, you know, that first 30% was a walk in the park and then the next, you know, 70% has been a little bit more, just longer lead. Yeah. It's all coming, but it just took a little bit longer than we yeah. anticipated. And I think what's really important is that where we fit within the market space. So we have maybe three different um I guess, categories, we have our really, really premium category, which sits within the hotel room, um, you know, behind the bar in all the kind of event spaces. So, you know, in these leading hotels that they're having, you know, a wedding and they want to serve 300 espresso martinis, we can do that. If they want to have, you know, a light martini or passion fruit martini, we can do that. And it just just makes sense. Then, you, of course, there's other um customers that we work with so to give you the other side of the scale we work with travel lodge where we're within 280 sites across the uk they take eight or nine blends this quality is still the same but it's just they might want a different blend that suits their customer so we're able to adapt across you know multiple different customers yeah. so you can go high high end five star all the way across to, you know, different variations of different kind of customers who have different supply demands who may want, you know, they've got, you know, 2000 hotel rooms yeah. or they could have, you know, you know, all different kinds of things, but we're able to adapt, which is the key yeah, thing. Only because you have that production facility. Exactly. Right? So that's why, you know, when things keep me up at night, I keep saying it was all <laughs> for the right reason. The production yeah. facility was the right reason. Yeah. yeah. So now you've got two successful businesses, yeah. a gorgeous family, oh. amazing business partner and husband. Um, what, like, did you make any mistakes? No, I, I'm sure you yeah, did. Like, lots I, of yeah, mistakes. Like, lots as, of as mistakes. founders, like, what's the biggest mistake you made? And what did you learn from it? Across both businesses, you know, there was definitely mistakes where, again, I wish I'd trusted my gut instinct earlier or I'd kind of not really, I, I guess just strategy. I think you have to really keep with the plan. I think sometimes you can go off kilter a little bit and that can take away from your core, who you are as a business and take away from your key strategy. And I think for me, I've really learned hard and fast to make sure to understand who we are as a business to make sure we kind of keep within those you know clear guidelines and our offering is what we are and who we are and remain like that I think that's key but I mean so many mistakes I mean you know there's always going to be you know hiring I, I've made a few key hires not very well you know I've just just in general, there's been always been things that I wish I'd done better, you know, but then as founders, we're always very hard on each other, aren't we? You know, you always kind of expect so much from yourself. Yeah. So when something goes wrong, you do, you do kind of hound your, you know, hound yourself for not being accountable for not seeing that earlier. But, you know, that's just human, human yeah. fault, isn't yeah. it? What specific mistakes did you make and what did you learn from it? I think hiring, I think, that, I think let's go back to that for a second. I think for me, I think sometimes I I put too much too much trust into th to people potentially, and sometimes you feel that it's not quite, you know, that loyalty quite isn't there. And I think mm. you know I think that that can be um, hard to process sometimes. You know, I think for me as a person, if I back someone or if I have someone on my team, I probably invest 100% of myself mm. mentally into that. And I kind yeah. of feel, so there has definitely been times, you know, when you find things out or someone has, you know, something's happened and you kind of feel, or someone's been underhand and you, you, you do, it's hard not to feel yeah, yeah. disappointed. Yeah, I'm the same. You know, and yeah. you know, you do, you do. And I guess like it's, it's so personal to us as well. Right. Everything's yeah. so personal. I mean, my husband's really good at saying you can't let this take you can, yeah. don't don't be so you can't be take it so personally. Yeah. But I am like, you know, I'm a really, really strong person. As an, I've got a really strong character, but I'm quite sensitive. Mm. So in people only my really, I guess, kind of close network would understand how sensitive that I probably am. I think as a founder or as a leader of a business, I probably come across to be quite harsh and hard and you know I have to make decisions because I have a responsibility to you know x amount of people you know the decisions I make today will affect them whether they like the decisions I'm making but sometimes they don't understand that I'm making it for the better cause of the business growth etc people do critique and they do say things I'm I, listen I'm sure I'm definitely not the most popular person in the room at any given time and I'm sure people have definitely got an opinion about me 
and so but on. But you're so not forth. there for a popularity contest, right? This you're there is to it. run a business. This is it. I, you know, and I always I learned that fast. You know, you have to divide your friendship from your business life. And, you know, by the way, I I I've got great friendships with yeah, a lot of my uh, team and I will continue to do so. But when I'm in a work environment, my business comes first and I, I have to make the decisions based off not because if I like someone more or this or that, I, I make them based off what's right for the business. But it is hard and I do take it. Sometimes it's hard, but I, I, I'm toughening up. You know, I, I've been doing this now for, you know, whatever amount of years, 16, 17 years, you do develop a thicker skin, but you learn a lot and you do but you do become a little bit more insular. I would say I'm probably a little bit more introverted than I used to be like. I think when we're at these large, you know, even if they're big company ga- gatherings, I, I I don't naturally love them. And not because I don't love spending time mm-hmm. with my team. It's more so just I feel that you're very much, you know, I don't know. I just yeah, feel that, very much. That's so interesting. I'm kind of the same because I used to love like partying, yeah. so many friends. Like I was always extroverted, but yeah. I am turning more into an intro. I, yeah. I love to have my own space. I love my team. Yeah. Like, yeah. don't get me wrong. Yeah, I, mean, me too. I love yeah. like, going out for drinks and things, but I really need my time yeah. like, alone. Yeah. Ma- no. it, it might be partially because I have kids and like they're yeah. like spring around, mommy, mommy, mommy. Yeah. And I guess like when you become a parent, you kind of become insular anyways. You do. Right? And then with the business, you, yeah. you've got that extra kid. I know. You do become very. <laughs> Answer, don't you? And I think, as you said, I think we try really hard to be around a lot for our kids. But one thing I would say as well is that our kids have been brought up with a really good sense of understanding that we do have to work. So I think that's really good. You know, there's a lot of, and by the way, I, I, I think it's phenomenal I think I think you know when I'm at home alone with my kids I'm like how do people do this full time I, do it. I find it it it's drives hard. me crazy it's, it's, but it's harder than a, a office way job. harder like you know I I think well God, when you go to the office you can have your coffee yeah it's a <laughs> like it's so so full-on um so you know I go to the office I'm like god that's I'm having a break um no what I mean by that is that we try between myself and Jack luckily we're in a really good position that we can like team tag it a lot so you know um and we also have a phenomenal nanny who's been with us for six and a half years and you know she's there eight till seven every day and so even if we're if we're home she's just able to help us just as a, a second pair or third pair of hands really you know with, with three kids it's a lot but going back to them understanding and recognizing um having i guess parents who work you know we of course we try and do the best we can and be where we need to be and you know do all of that but equally there's definitely times where i might have to take a call in the evening or you know i might be working during the holidays and you know that's just something they've grown up with but I think it's given them a really good sense of a work a good work ethic Mm. and I think that's and I'm really starting to see that within my older son who's turning oh he's just turned 10 and you know he has got this phenomenal you know work ethic and wanting to kind of do things and ask questions and come to work with us and he really understands how you know how that all works and I think that's really really great for them to learn by and uh, you know we lead by example and I think that's really really key because you know of course there's times where you know we've all had it you have the mum guilt I mean everyone has it so you know of course you feel guilty you know and your kids at times can make you feel bad but I think the greatness outweighs the evil of it in terms of you know I think it's still really key that they see that we have to work hard because, you know, if they want to do nice things, they go to nice schools, they get nice things. You have to work that, you yeah. know, that, that that's. Do you think they want to be entrepreneurs or any of them want to be entrepreneurs? Do they talk about that? You know, they do. They, they that's really, amazing. That, which is amazing. You know, give them any, any, any given time, they'll be out in that park trying to sell lemonade. Oh, trying to I do love that. They're, 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 they're always... My kids have been asking for it. They're like, yeah. can we set up a lemonade yeah. stand? They, they, everything, can we sell this? I'm like, they, they just <laughs> want to sell everything. I mean, one day I'm going to come back, the house will be empty, they'll have sold everything. Aww. But they, they have a really good, like, entrepreneurial yeah. mind uh, you know and I, I think that's brilliant you know yeah. and they you always when I ask them what they want to do you know they always you know say so many weird and wonderful things but all very creative yeah um, and also I guess when we set up lockdown liquor our kids were we were in the kitchen together till probably 2 a.m in the morning like squeezing limes they saw firsthand and I have to say it was brilliant I was uh going down for a meeting down in a bath uh, a couple of days ago and we ran into WH Smith and they just started stocking our easy liquor. And my middle son, Levi, he spotted it and it, he was so impressed. 
he was like, you know, just You're in because, Smith. just <laughs> well, just because you know he's been there, they've seen it from the start, and then to watch it, you know, because you know they hear us talking, but to see it in a you know in a big retail yeah. or anywhere like that, or if he if he goes into a you know a restaurant and they're serving our our cocktails it really lands with them because they were there from the very start. Yeah. They used to help us tape all the boxes together. So they were, you know, they were part of that very early journey. And I think that's been a really nice, you know, for them to see it evolve and suddenly become this big brand. I think that that's kind of also stemmed them on to, you know, they kind of go, oh, I want to do something like that, mummy. You know, I want to do that. Like they, they, you know, want to do something different and creative, which I, which I love. And I'm all yeah, for that. I yeah. love that. Yeah. yeah. So it's nice. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So what's next for you? Personally ne and professionally? Well, I think it's head down. I think the next three years are going to be super exciting across both businesses. So I think it's it's really down to this hyperscale mode for both businesses. Um, yeah, and then hopefully, you know, in four years' time, I can just go and retire and sit on the beach somewhere. Oh, the dream. <laughs> the dream. The <laughs> dream. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm excited. Yeah, super yeah, exciting. Amazing. And what's one advice you'd give an early stage entrepreneur? I think... Don't be scared to make that jump. I think what's the worst that can happen? I think so many people and younger generation, you do overthink everything because you kind of go through this kind of textbook viewpoint of what something needs to make perfect sense before you make the leap of faith to kind of do it. I think at the end of the day, you're all, even if you fail, you'll have learned something along that journey of failing. So I think there's no downside. I think we spend so much of our life you know, worrying about, you know, but what happens if this happens? What happens if that happens? I think sometimes there comes a point of time that you go, okay, well, what's the worst that can happen? You know, I'm going to just try it. And, you know, don't go too big too fast. I think, you know, I'm not suggesting anyone should go and get, you know, a massive bank loan and, and start a business without any kind of proven record that this business will be a success. But equally, you can start in different ways. You can start to kind of do it part time. You can start to scale slowly. And I think that gives you a bit more confidence and confidence and will agree, you know, create success. It's all it's all about a bit of this, a bit of that, a bit of luck, a bit of confidence. But I think if you as a person or believe in something, then that's halfway there. I think you just need to back yourself. And I think that's half the battle. Yeah. I think to have the confidence to do that. Yeah. Have the confidence. Have the confidence. Just do it. Just jump just on do it. it. Great advice. It. Yeah. yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Tasha. Oh, it was so energizing. So and thank so you so fun. much for having us. Thank you for having me. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. Don't forget to follow the podcast wherever you're listening or watching. You can follow me at Connie Nam. Astrid and Mew at Astrid and Mew and Unboxed Instagram page at Unboxed underscore Founder Confidential. See you next week.